So before we get into today's episode, of course, I got to let you know the comic book gods did not want you to have this interview. Uh, we had recording and internet issues on the actual recording. And so this is actually two conversations stitched together. If you can find the seam, then leave a comment and let me know. Cause, uh, yeah, that was crazy. And then as I'm filming this intro, I'm in the middle of Hurricane Debbie. My power has been flickering all day. It's been crazy. But I promise this conversation is worth all the trouble I'm going through to make sure you hear it. And it's going to be worth your time on the listen. Uh, so huge thanks to Joe Corallo for sitting down with me twice to make sure that you got all the information that you need. And also a huge thanks to our uh, sponsor for today's episode, Fight or Flight Comics. Fight or Flight Comics is my LCS located in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the same little spot that used to house Ultimate Comics Raleigh. Uh, they keep me covered. Dan and Emily are the best. So if you go in there, you're shopping for comics, let them know BJ Kick sent you. They'll be glad to know it and they'll treat you even more special than they already would. And so with that, Let's get into today's episode. All right, guys. So my next guest, let's just say uh, if you listen to t people talking about comics on the Internet, you'll probably recognize this next voice. Um, but not only is he a commenter, a uh, cultural critic, if you will, uh, but he's also a writer and editor of comics in his own right. Uh, so today I'm here to talk with Mr. Joe Corallo. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? And thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem, man. I'm doing well. It's funny. I feel like we got conflicting things going on here. Right? I feel like I, I go for like a quiet storm with my voice. And I don't know, you're somewhere between like late night talk show host and like afternoon drive talk radio and with a little sportscaster in there. It's a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. I hear it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, how are you doing, man? You know, overall, fine. Uh, I'm still, uh, my voice is almost completely back from Heroes Con. It's, uh, it's pretty shot, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm managing. Yeah. No, nah, I'm, my voice is fine, but just the coming back from Heroes, I think my issue is that I took a vacation the week before. So I went yeah. on vacation, came home for three days, went to Heroes, and now I'm back and I just feel completely flustered. I'm, I'm almost settled back into routine though. Nice, nice. No, that's, that's good. Yeah, the flight I had back was delayed too. So, like, it's, I, I, uh, what was it? We got, uh, was it? I got off the plane at like five in the morning, mm. you, you know, on like Monday. So it's just like, oh, so it's, uh, kind of made the whole week uh, a little rocky, but it's going to be fine. It's all fine. Yeah, for sure. Everything's <laughs> fine. <laughs> so funny enough, right? You know, I like to go into these interviews, I like to do uh, a, good, a fair amount of research, right? Ask questions yeah, that yeah. one else is asking, um, yeah. you know, but unfortunately for you, the time I would have spent doing research somehow got sucked with me uh, watching two episodes of King Arthur and the Knights of Justice. So we would have to get this information the old fashioned way. I'm just going to ask you questions. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I guess so. But um, so, well, uh, I guess I'll start with you know we we sort of hear you as a, as a guest on a lot of uh, different comic channels. You you tend to be I don't know a part of the the CNN panel, if you will. Um, yeah. You know, whenever there's current events, things to discuss. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you're always introduced as like writer and editor and things, but I hadn't done much research into like just sort of your backstory and, and, and your journey sure. in comics. Uh, so what was that like for you? Sure. I, I mean, I'll, I'll go into some stuff that, um, you know, I, I actually don't talk about that much. So um, way back when I, I want to say around 2012, uh, I, I was, um, I think that's right around when I met, uh, Molly Jackson and we, we later, uh, edited an, uh, anthology together, uh, mine, uh, to benefit Planned Parenthood. But I started cause she, with her friend, uh, uh Andrea, uh, co-ran this like, uh, pop culture website, insert geek here. Okay. So I was writing like comic reviews and stuff for, for them, you know, like 12, 11 years ago. Mm. And that's really that. And then uh, I, I became a contributor at a comic mix, um, 
which is uh, run by Glenn Hallman. But, you know, at the time there was also uh, Denny O'Neill used to be a columnist there and uh, John Ostrander and uh, Martha Thomas's uh, Mike Gold, uh, Mindy Newell. So so I kind of like that's kind of how I got, you know, really started in, um, you know, sort of comics uh, reviews, uh, critiquing discussions and, and things like that before. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, YouTube and podcasting and, and, and whatnot. And it was from being a columnist at a uh, comic mix that uh, the, uh, you know, the mine uh, benefit anthology, you know, sort of came out of that. Gotcha. Uh, and then uh, once that happened, um, one of the people I, uh, I work with on that, uh, Max Asagio, I, I had paired her with Brian Talbot, in that anthology and she was doing more kim and kim and uh the editor at the time katie rex had a a conflict couldn't do it uh Mm -hmm. for the third volume so i was brought in uh for that and you know things kind of snowballed from there but that's right right around how that sort of happened and uh vault was aware of the mine anthology and all that and then i i kind of got a relationship going with them and that's how she said destroy happened like all that sort of stuff so got you so i'll ask you uh, the last editor i had on was christopher priest and Mm -hmm. you know priest is from sort of the old marvel bullpen uh and then later at dc right but uh i asked him kind of what the job of an editor was and you know he just kind of talked about like being sort of the first creative in the room i'm curious to know how much that job has changed from then to now like what would you how would you describe the job of an editor now sure i I mean it's it it, it's it's changed and and in some ways it's still the same depends where you go a funny story about that um you know, I, I know Jim Salica pretty well, and, and he's mm-hmm. talked before in the past about, you know, working with Christopher Priest was an editor at uh, Marvel and being like, man, he he had like a, a real office, like he had it all set up like nice, like he worked in like a business uh-huh. and, and Jim would be like, I just had like a knickknacks and stuff on like the, the desk and just like piles of comics and things. But he was like, but Christopher Priest, like. He, he seemed like he was working for like a company. It was crazy, you know, <laughs> but, um, I can see but that. Uh, yeah. Right. It's, uh, but I, I mean, it, it, it all varies with the, with what is being edited. So, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to creator owned stuff, for example, it's very different uh, mm-hmm. a lot of times because you're when it's creator owned you're usually brought in by the creative team Mm -hmm. to be like we need someone to you know make sure the ship stay in the course we need someone who's you know keeping us all on time checking in making sure we're not making mistakes when you're dealing with um some of these other companies for example like so a lot of smaller publishers Mm -hmm. it's like creator owned but also many times they own a piece of it yeah so so editorials are slightly different rather than like if you were you know doing a kickstarter purely creator owned you're like doing an image book they still have a say in it they still have you know this is our company and we have certain parameters yeah uh that we have to go by so it's a little more hands-on you know, even though it's creator owned, they're going to have suggestions of like, oh, well, can you do this, do that? They might um, suggest cover artists. They might, um, you know, get involved in a more micro way than than you would at, at like an image. And then there are like the work for higher gigs, and mm-hmm. and those can be a lot more, um, you know, hands on with with editorial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and those are those are the situations where you start getting more like no you're like you are the writer you are the artist or you are you know the letter or colors whatever who is hired mm-hmm. for this project like mm-hmm. the editor is then the one who is putting the team together um you know sometimes uh if it's a licensed book mm-hmm. then it's the editor is presenting to the licensor right 
the team and then there's that other extra layer on it but like you know if you're doing a book at like marvel or dc or something it's the editor who's like okay i'm putting this team together depending on where you're at depending on certain things maybe have a little more say in Mm -hmm. in who's on the team or who's not or or how you're going to approach it but but yeah i I mean that's that is still comparable to to the past but like for like marvel and dc for example they sort of ebb and flow in the different eras so Mm -hmm. like I think we all kind of understand that, you know, during like some of the early eras where it was, you know, Stan was like kind of show running everything and, you know, having who could, you know, fill in or, 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 or do the job. But it was really, it was more or less Stan's vision for those first few years or so. Right. You know, cut all the way to late eighties, early nineties, image revolution time. It was very artist driven, Mm -hmm. situation you know famously um you know you had uh bob harris like uh, giving more prominence to jim lee and some of the Mm -hmm. others with with x-men before before jim's departure yeah in the early 2000s it was like writer dominated these writers you know your bendis's mark millers etc were Mm -hmm. were kind of dictating more as, as as things were going we're right now in a very editorial driven uh time so the editor is now at the big two for the most part mm-hmm. and this has happened in the past and this has always kind of been there to some extent but yeah right now it's very much like editorial or higher up okay look we we have this character that's going to be in a movie or you know we know mm-hmm. james gunn's going to do something with metamorpho so we we this is the time to do a metamorpho one shot or a mini series like I, I just an example i'm not saying that's what's happening right now but yeah and then it's you know higher up going down to the editor you need to make this book and then the editor figuring out who's getting plugged into that book and yeah. it's maybe a little less like some editors it, depending on the project are looking for pitches others are looking for a team to fit the pitch they're going with mm. like okay we have this you know we we know that you know james gunn or whatever is going to do x y and z with metamorpho so that's the blueprint yeah for what we want to do we are plugging in a team to this pitch we're not asking a writer what would you do with metamorpho we're asking a writer can you write this exact like like sort of story so that's kind of changed things uh, Mm -hmm. i i think a lot like like when christopher priest was doing you know spider-man for example when yeah was one of the big things he was doing you know and and i'm not saying this to to take away from christopher priest at all x-men was such a juggernaut Mm -hmm. at the time that he probably had a little more of a say and a little more wiggle room and control than if he were on you know maybe even x-men or something at that time where it was like this is the sales driver and it's like he he might have had a little more like there were certain things that had to happen Mm -hmm. but you know he might have had like oh if i want to try someone out or if i want to do this then like maybe get less pushback than if it was you know uh claremont on x-men saying like doing something like oh you know i'm kind of sick of wolverine let's just get rid of them and like yeah right. you know, there's certain things you just couldn't do but yeah but yeah and then you know as, as time went on though like there were certain things i think it was right when jim salakrup took over mm-hmm. um was when they did the wedding but mm-hmm. that was a situation where like jim shooter had asked you know jim salakrup like oh you, you know we, we should do this wedding are you good with that and he's like yeah and then he was like all right it's gonna happen like you know a couple of months and you know like whereas initially like jim salakrup was like oh i got some time let me start planning right. this and they're like no 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 we need that sales bump we need to get this moving so you know yeah. so, so i think there's there are some changes but there's also a lot of things that are, are either similar or it, you know are somewhat comparable i mean I, I think probably the biggest thing and probably something that christopher priest and anyone who was editing in the 80s would be like is uh 
digital, like just being able to like upload files mm -hmm. into like an FTP or like a Google drive or Dropbox or right. That's, that's huge. Uh, I yeah. mean, that was, I think it's, it's easy to sort of forget the uh, amount of time that was spent, you, you know, uh, and, and the money to FedEx mm -hmm. things and have couriers like, you, you know, uh, running around. I mean, like when, when Astonishing X-Men was coming out, uh, you, you know, and uh, Whedon and, uh, and uh, John Cassidy were, were doing that. You know, it was like Marvel would just... You, Cassidy was in the city, so they'd send a courier to have to pick up the pages and mm. you know rush around. It's it's crazy thinking about it at that point, but yeah, yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, it's so much of the job of an editor is is wrangling the book together, um, yep. <laughs> going and snatching the pages off the artist's table. Like, no, you're done drawing, right? Yep. Um, all the things. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I I hadn't thought about it until you said it, but we're definitely in like an era of sort of the editor at center, right? Like even just in fan lexicon, like I can name like seven editors off the top of my head and, and it's easy. Right. And, and it's like, I'm thinking like, like Nate Cosby at uh dynamite doing Disney stuff right now. Um, you yeah. know, Will Moss, uh, all, anyway, the point being, Oh yeah. <laughs> there are all these editors, like, their names are just as big as the writers. Um, and you sort of look to see, okay, well, who's doing this? Where does this fit? Right. Oh, Nick Lowe's editing this. Okay. So this is in the spider office. All right. So this should fit in this little world. Um, I don't even find like DC, uh, right. DC has got the Superman world, but all the green lantern stuff is in there with Kaminsky, right? Like there's a bunch of stuff, yeah. you know, but this is funny because, and maybe I'm in the weeds because, you know, I do this, but yeah. to, to the point, like the editors are really big right now. Um, yeah. And uh, I believe like with the, I think absolute power is under uh, Paul Kaminsky. So, oh, cool. so, it, but like, and this goes into like, like the, the web and the communication because excuse me, it's like, so if he's doing this event, there's also back characters and you know fail safe and stuff like that so it's like right. having to coordinate with the bad office and mm -hmm. like uh wonder woman and, and superman internal he deals with it but you know not batman's without mm -hmm. some level of coordination so you, you know with with these sort of things that's sort of how it goes but but yeah i, I believe you know that sort of stuff is you know it's like kaminsky and and and, and down on that or, or he's you know helming it i think uh I think like Brittany uh, Holzer was mm -hmm. helmed, you, you know, the, was it beast world, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, from last year. So like, like all these things that, that, you know, like, you know, others kind of like taking the reins and, and doing this and coordinating. It's, it's a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you're editing books, you're editing anthologies, you're editing books for smaller publishers what are some of the things you're taking into consideration as you're assembling these creative teams to, to get these stories told? I mean, it's, it's a combination of things, right? So like you want someone that's going to fit the, the book or the property or, or you think can, mm -hmm. um, I do think everyone you know who's editing you always have to be scouting and be mindful of of different things and, and be aware of what's out there because it's very easy to keep going back to the same people over and over again yeah or to you know pigeonhole people you know unfairly many times because it's like oh i got you to do this horror book and you did really well so i'm just gonna keep you know calling you for horror uh mm -hmm. books and like oh i have this sci-fi book but you're a horror guy and it's like no, you made that that guy horror horror guy mm. like by just yeah. giving the horror book. So like, so there there is that element to it. Um, but you, you also have to balance that with working with people that you know are going to get it done and done on time and not stress you out. Mm -hmm. Every editor who's done enough editing in comics will have stories that are like, well, it was you know this person handed in things on time, this person did not, this person really did not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you get sort of to a point of, you have to weigh, 
is is the the stress of it worth the the payoff of the product and sometimes it is and sometimes right. it isn't you know um there, there have been many nights uh depending on the different project where you know i'm i'm sending emails at 2 a.m just being like i can't i can't go to sleep until i know i got this because this is going to the printer in the morning so like mm -hmm. i'll keep bugging you because i gotta because i'm not getting sleep and you need to know you are making me not go to sleep so but, you know, it, it, it happens, but, you know, a, a lot of times it's all right, but you, you run into these problems of problems, a strong word, but you, you run into these situations where anyone who's in comics kind of knows comics enough to be like, oh, well, I can blow this deadline because I know the editor is not going to give me like the actual deadline. They're going to like give me mm -hmm. like. Oh, I'm going to tell you I need it this day. So there's like that weak buffer when you blow it. Okay. And then it turns into like, oh, well, I know I have an extra week. And then they blow that week. To, you know, so there, there's there's some of that. But I mean, I've also worked with people that get things in early and I never have to, you know, track them down. And it's situations like that mm -hmm. where you go like if you're making my life easy i want i want to figure out ways to work with you again like i will right. finagle ways to to do that and you know unless you are so good it's worth it yeah you know so, so with all that in consideration right i think so often what we hear at least on youtube is the fan perspective right so people will complain about the creative direction of a story or dialogue or art or whatever the case may be. And, you know, I certainly never think in those moments like, yeah, but he probably got it in on time. And it's probably easier to work with that guy than whoever else I'd insert in that place. Right. Um, how long before the publisher even realizes fan reaction or reception or is it really just sales and no one's really looking at the noise around books it's all tough because of how it works right where it's you know, you have your final order cutoffs you have your um you know uh stores for the most part have already finished ordering the first three issues before the first issue comes out yeah and there's a sort of natural cutting in half between you know issue one and two which mm -hmm. is why you occasionally hear stories like i i believe this is the case of um you know like conan the barbarian at, uh, mm -hmm. over at uh titan was oh the sales are actually ticking back up mm -hmm. and and that's because of the strong word of mouth but but often yeah the the sales naturally go down because they don't know what it's going to sell you don't want to sit on so much product before anything happens so you know you get books like that there are a handful of other books that have been doing that uh recently but on uh, usually when you hear stories about books getting extended beyond like a mini series or something like that yeah that tends to be after like the third or fourth issue because mm -hmm. they need they need to get to a point where does it does issue one sell out does issue two like is there another does it need to go to another printing yeah. that's a little tricky though because especially you know if you're a, a publisher of a certain size or something like that or mm -hmm. or maybe you just um or you want to get some free press you, yeah. you know maybe maybe you do a print run that you know is going to sell out not mm -hmm. that it's like it, you know i'm not saying it's like ooh, a 500 print run so we can sell you know but it's it's enough where they're like we know that it'll sell out so right. we can go to the second printing mm -hmm. and then and then after that it's like okay what are the reorders on issue two after issue one comes out yeah you know, that's where you start figuring out like, oh, OK, so if if the numbers start ticking up, like if you get to like issue five, six and the numbers are going up like like Kona was doing, mm -hmm. 
if reorders start going up for issue two, if issue two sells out like after the fact because of reorders, things like that, then that's when you're like, okay, there's something going on here right? Um, with this book because it has to go beyond just issue one mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, speculators, things like that, um, that aren't necessarily going to be there for issue 13. Right. You know? Right. Cool. So, so you go from a uh, sort of critic and columnist, uh, you get into sort of editorial roles. And of course, now you're, you're writing comics, but was writing and editing comics always the goal or was it a thing that kind of happened and you're like, Oh, Hey, I'm here. Let's do more. I mean, it's, it was always the goal to do, do creative writing. Uh, I, I mean, I've been a comics fan uh, since about third grade. I, I was big on Sonic the Hedgehog. I found out that Archie was doing Sonic comics. So I was picking those up and that, that got me to like get my parents to drag me to the different local comic shops, go back issue dive and get a subscription mail to the house. So that really got me into, to comics like specifically like direct market uh comics and then you know in high school started reading more like you know marvel um you know runaways altered spider-man uh things like that but but i took creative writing in in high school and college you know at least uh one course in in both i i did like you know mega man and sonic fan fiction and like elementary school mm. um but but yeah, it was always in in my mind. I had friends in like college who who wanted to figure out doing like superhero related type like TV pitches. Mm-hmm. So I worked on some stuff like that. Um, and I'm trying to think. I, I think a lot of the the stuff we were working on there, like that that was like um, a, a bit of like superheroes in college kind of setting. Yeah. And uh, I suggested it be called Masters of the University, and um, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, but like, it works. Um, I like it. Yeah, right. So, see, see, art. It was a good idea. Anyway, so so did that. But then I, I you know, I was working. Uh, I, I was involved in a political campaigns for a couple of years or so out of out of college, but. I, I wanted to get back to writing mm-hmm. and when I did, I was like, you know, I, I want to stick to comics. Yeah. Cause, uh, I, you know, when I, I started, um, you know, self publishing some stuff, uh, back in 2010. So mm-hmm. I was doing it like really before I got into like the comics criticism really. But I, so I self published two issues of one book and then like four of another book. Yeah. Um, you know, the first one was with Bob Wolf, who has a big like gaming YouTube channel. It's like over mm-hmm. seven hundred thousand subs. Like uh, Wolf wow. Sten, um does very well. Um, nice. And and then the uh, the other guy I I collaborated with when I was self publishing uh, was Danny Lockert, who's gone on to you know do do he just did something with uh, uh, Karina Becco at um, Boom, a sci fi book um and then he he did um red mother at boom as well lucky me i, I got the in there right here let's look it up oh yeah well, danny lucker is that l-u-c-k e-r-t l-u-c-k e-r-t yeah cool what is happening all right, I don't know what's going on with my internet, but the Zoom call is still working. So hey, that that's good. That's yeah, good. <laughs> I bet I can do it on my phone. I bet. Give me a second. It's a what was that? Oh, the um, the space between. Oh, okay, got you. Yeah. So he's he's doing that right now. Um, yeah, Red Mother. He did a few books with uh with Colin Bunn. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, so he's doing great. So that is awesome. Okay. So you're always into creative writing. You mm. get into criticism. 
you get into editing and you, you find your way back into writing comics. Um, yeah. So I'll ask this. I feel like I ask this fairly often with other people, but um, sure. as a writer, are you writing because you feel like there's a specific story that needs to be told? Like, I know, like talking to Greg Pak, right? Like he talks about like mm -hmm. sort of themes in his work and, and the goal of his writing really just sort of um, highlighting the humanity in whoever the character may be and feeling like he could tell stories um, or you could bring more people together, like telling stories than like being politically active because he worked on political campaigns as yeah. well. So like, there's people that bring like these sort of, I guess, virtues or themes to their writing. And they're like, all right, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is my manifesto. Or is mm -hmm. it just like, Hey, I want to tell stories just because. Yeah. I think, um, you know, for me, I, I do like, ideally, uh, want to tell a, a story. I, I want to pull on people's heartstrings. I want to make them laugh, things like that. But there is an element of it that like, yeah, that's, that's where the, the passion lies, but also oh, I love writing. So mm -hmm. I would rather get paid to write than paid to do other things. Yeah. So I, I will write a job that's um you, you know and i do like some you know like uh copywriting for companies on the side and things like that because i it's writing i'm getting yeah. paid to write and you, you know and and that's great to me but yeah i i mean you know sometimes with with things you, you know maybe you're you're working with an editor on, on a property or you're working with a licensor and you have to tell a certain story or you have to get a certain thing across that may not, you know, it may not be the idea you would have had, you know, or mm -hmm. it may not be, you know, exactly how you want to tell the story, but like, that's the job. Yeah. You know, there, there's an element of this, this is a job and you're getting paid to do a job um, mm -hmm. for certain projects, mm -hmm. you, you know, um, I think the for me, and I think for a lot of writers, it's important to balance that. Mm -hmm. I think you know if if you're trying to survive off comics and your approach is, I have to be very selective with what I do and I'm trying to tell this kind of story or have a specific message and that's it, mm -hmm. you're you're gonna be in trouble. Yeah. You know, if you have another job or another source of income, and this is, you know, either a hobby or, or something that isn't, you know, vital to your survival, then sure, of course, right. do, do that all day. And uh, I do think, and this is a completely other conversation, you know, we mm -hmm. won't get into, but I do think that there should be more of a discussion, understanding around that it's okay for this to be a hobby for people and mm -hmm. their books are just as important as, you know, people that this is their job and yeah. it's okay. And people shouldn't have imposter syndrome over that sort of stuff or feel like they're not, they shouldn't be in the room, but you know, when, when it, when it comes to that sort of thing. And then the other side of that is if all, if you get to a point where there's no passion mm -hmm. and it's just, I just need the paycheck, man. You're just doing it. That is another separate and equally, if not more devastating of a problem to have. Yeah. So it's about balancing that you need to balance your expectations. You, you need to do something to feed your passion interest, but you know, and you also have to make money and, um, and, you know, work on things that you may not be passionate about. There is a difference between working on on something that you feel is like adverse to your moral standing yeah that that is different i i'm mm -hmm. talking about like you know like oh i really want to tell a story about superman in space but they're like nope he's grounded for a year and you're not allowed to use lex luther and you're not allowed to use brainiac and 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 just being like I'll figure it out. Like right. 
rather than you know so just to clarify yeah no for sure it's funny i would i just at heroes con the only panel i went to was one of the first on friday and it was greg rucka mark guggenheim uh stephanie williams and yes. rodney barnes and you know their their talk they're supposed the talk was supposed to be about like this sort of writing across different genres um yeah. but the point was raised i want to say by stephanie but just about the fact that like hey it's okay for this to be a job like it's okay to acknowledge that this is a job you know sure there are people who would love to be writing for these companies right but you shouldn't be made to feel like oh i'm just lucky to be in the room all the time oh um, yeah and, and i think it was greg that, tri that chimed in like yeah like you know sometimes i write because i like you know having lights on and living yeah. in a house right so um yeah it's funny that you you kind of said the same thing like gotta pay the bills gotta get the lights on um but yeah there's definitely a, a happy medium that has to be found for sure and i think part of reaching that too is i think it's healthy to to approach these like i try to approach it as a challenge mm -hmm. like if they're like hey this is the project you have to get this done i look at it as a challenge a puzzle to solve rather than like ah that's not the idea i had i'm like how can i do this like what what is the key to breaking this story and and making it happen in yeah. in the way they're trying to envision because mm -hmm. you know I, I just look at that as like okay you're starting here the story needs to go there go through that maze how do you get there how do you figure it out and right. and i think you know that's a good way to to try to look at it and and tackle those things and keep it interesting for yourself all right joe so we're talking about doing work like writing um as a passion as a as a, a love labor of love and then also as mm -hmm. a labor right yeah so how does king arthur and the knights of justice come about for you so for me um it, it, it actually came about uh in part because i was a fan of the show at, at the time when it was airing i was at uh baltimore comic con so we've been 2022 um, and I had wrapped up the script duties on uh, Die in the Dark. That first issue was uh, prepped, getting ready to go to the printer because that was out in December 2022. Mm. So I was talking to some of the people over at Man Cave because they, they were boothing there. And it was basically like, hey, you know, I, I like doing Dahlia. I like doing, uh, you know, Beckstar. So, like, I'd love to do more stuff if there's something else, you know, coming up. And uh, they mentioned, oh, um, well since you mentioned it, are you aware of um you know princess guinevere and the jewel riders and i was like you know i, I didn't watch that as a kid but i watched the show king arthur and the knights of justice mm -hmm. and yeah they're like oh okay like we'll keep that in mind you know like interesting and then you know later on they were like oh, you know we actually do have the rights to this show and you know we talked a little bit back and forth and you know i was able to get that gig which was great mm -hmm. um I, I had a lot of fun working on that um and you know i'd i'd love to do more so people should uh probably buy that uh to give me that opportunity because that'd be really really nice so so i'm curious as to how this goes because um uh, in researching for this interview well i should have mm -hmm. been researching ended up just watching king arthur and the knights of justice for like two Fair. hours but <laughs> it struck me as a cartoon that was like just so clearly 80s i mean it's a 90s cartoon but i don't know if it's just a theme song or just the sports references or the fact that they referenced madonna or what but it's like this show just feels like it feels like a period piece but you're writing yeah. this graphic novel and obviously it has to have some sort of modern sensibilities or maybe there is just like the sort of flashback or nostalgic nature to it how are you balancing that or looking at this property and saying well let's write something with this world and universe but today yeah i mean i wanted to stay true to a lot of what was going on in the show but yeah update a little bit age it up a little mm -hmm. um you know I, I got to you know have some more violence and it's a little 
darker and grittier than than the cartoon was but you, know, you want to keep it in that same vein so for me part of that was you know keeping that like over the top merlin and morgana stuff mm -hmm. uh making sure that arthur's still uh you know more or less like a boy scout type character um mm -hmm. but but yeah i um I think part of how we were able to do that, um, you know, uh, Gaia uh, Cardinelli, the the artist, uh, you know, kept the designs pretty close uh, to to the cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that did a lot of the the heavy lifting, doing that and keeping you know Merlin and Guinevere and some of these other characters, you know, speaking certain ways. I, I think kind of kept that, but you know, the the biggest thing uh, for me with this was the the difference between a a show that was designed for syndication and to to last versus doing a graphic novel that has like a nice little bow on it that tells you a complete story mm -hmm. um you know so like there were elements of the show that uh, you know i decided and and you know it, it went over well was um like the keys that they had to get to like you know free them each individually like there wasn't time for something like that in in this format like it right. works great if you have a show that you mm -hmm. want to have like you know 100 or so episodes of that that's a great uh device to keep things moving along and to keep the stakes you know high and and things throughout mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't work in a you know one and done sort of graphic novel format right. so like making those kind of decisions were were, were part of it got you and now um you've kind of you've edited or written on comics for a bunch of different age ranges but what are the considerations that you're making when it's a graphic novel for you know presumably a younger audience now with with that i mean that this is something i heard um from uh fred van lenti at a bar years ago i think it was fontana's and uh in the Lower East Side when they still recorded a uh, comic book club live there. Mm. So yeah, this is like maybe like 10, 11 years ago or something where, uh, and, and Fred is, is also very well known, not just for, you know, some of his, you know, darker and grittier comics that he's done over the years, but for doing comics more for, for kids, like the comic mm. book history of, you know, comics and animation and, um, you know, uh, uh, comics about like the presidents and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his advice was basically, um, you know, talking about this sort of stuff, you know, tell the story you want to tell, like, like, don't like sort of pigeonhole yourself into like, I need to tell a story that's going to appeal very specifically to 12 to 17 year olds or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, tell the story it's a good story people read it and um so the only real considerations for me with something like this was like make sure it's not over the top violence to a certain point just be be aware of that and the language and otherwise you know tell tell as mature a story as you would you know for anything um mm -hmm. But a part of that, too, was something like King Arthur and the Knights of Justice that also um, made it easier was, you know, having the show and stuff. Yeah, you, know, you want to stay true to the show. So there are things like the characters wouldn't say or do that's kind of like baked in. So it wouldn't even cross my mind to have yeah. them in certain situations. So so all of that together, you know, sort of guided this. But. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't really struggle too much in, in terms of trying to make it fit in, in in that exact way. But but yeah, I I think the the best way to go, if possible, and I know it's very difficult with the way you know some things are or what people are looking for. Very you know specific sort of niche things is you know telling a good story, um, and then you know I, I think you're probably better off telling a good story and then having you know the editor or the licensor then be like you can't do x y or z rather than you know censoring yourself too much outside of the obvious things like language and like over the top violence and stuff like that right so i mean 
obviously you're a writer and you love writing, you love storytelling, and I'm sure there's mm -hmm. a bunch of ideas floating around in your head, right? But to what degree are these ideas things that you're actively pursuing? Like you're maybe you're pitching it to someone like, okay, well, I've got this idea for maybe this character mm -hmm. and maybe you have to repurpose it or, or something, or is it just yep. someone's calling you up like, hey, you got anything for this? Like, how does that work for you? At this point in my comics writing career, it's kind of split down the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I I get asked to to write work for higher things, but I'm also actively pitching. Um, so I'll have. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of comic writers have this, but I have, you know, a bunch of Google Docs of different pitches and in various degrees of development. And, you know, I might do a round of pitches with it. If if it doesn't get any traction, put it to the side a bit, come back, retool it a bit and, and maybe try it again. Um, th there's uh, one idea I've been kicking around for a while. I won't get into the specifics here, but mm. I was like, you know what? This actually kind of, this could work in a different way if I change, like, like the, the overall story, like the, the, the background and, and the action and, and what's sort of driving it is, is sort of similar, but I'm like, I can change the characters and their motivations mm -hmm. and it's a fresh, different idea. And I can send that back out and be like, well, what if we take it in, in, in this direction? So, you know, I'm in the process of doing that with one of them. You know, there's there's a couple of others, too, that, you know, there, there's different opportunities come up to pitch or, or you talk to different editors or different publishers pop up. And sometimes things like that happen. I'll be like, wait a minute. I had this idea like three years ago. Let me look. I, I think it kind of fits with this new publisher mm. or or this publisher that maybe I now have a relationship with that I didn't when I was initially um, pushing it. And, you know, I, I look it over and I'm like, I can update this, this and this. And, you know, boom, uh, that that works, you know, like maybe, you know, a comic that you know, I put in like the log line, like it's the good place, but it's blah, blah, blah. And it didn't get picked up four or five years ago. And I'm mm -hmm. refreshing it. I'm like, well, maybe now let me pick something that's a little more you know relevant or talked about in the moment as much as I love the good place, for example, something right. like that. Right. And so with that, like how far does your sort of journal go back? Like, are you, I don't know, some people feel like they're ideas people. And so it's like, okay, that pitch didn't work. I'm done with that pitch forever. I'm coming up with something new. Other people yeah. will like write down every idea they've ever had and kind of flip through it. Like, okay, maybe it'll work this time. Or, you know, how, yeah. where do you see yourself on that spectrum? I mean, <sighs> I do just tend to come up with, you know, new ideas or other ideas. Like, like I, I have a pitch I, I was working on uh, very recently that I, I came up with on a phone call the other, like a week, two weeks ago and mm -hmm. is, is moving along. Um, you, you know, like, so, like it's, it's very, like I, I leave myself open to that sort of stuff and mm -hmm. you know, I'll pursue something or I'll, um, you know, I'll hit the pause button on something or like, you know, there, there's also been times where I've had a pitch and, and there was some interest in, in it maybe. And like, you know, like, oh, make these changes or do this. And like, we'll see. And like, you know, sometimes you're, you're doing it and it's like, well, you know, if I, I do this or if I'm approaching it this way, like, I don't know if it's going to work that way. Or like, I don't know if, uh, if that story I want to tell. So like, maybe I'll back burner this and, and go with a different idea that, um, you know, people can be more on board with out the gate or that the suggestions align closer to, to what I'm, I'm wanting to, to do or what I was thinking. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is going to be a good fit here. So like for me, I, I feel like, you know, I, I understand story enough. I can just come up with ideas. I don't really, well, like if I'm working on a pitch, and I see something similar is coming out. I can pivot and work on something else. I'm not, 
I know there are certain types of people and I get it. It's a personality type thing too, where, mm -hmm. you, you know, you fixate on like, this is my idea and this is what I want to do. And that's just not me. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to come up with ideas and I could come up with five ideas and a publisher could be like, we don't like any of them. And I'll be like, I got five more of me. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll hit you up, you know, soon. And I'll give you another five. You don't like that. I got another five and just keep going because, you know, they're just ideas. Right. You know, it's um, when you understand story structure and, and um, character and, and this and that, you can kind of like mix and match things. You can, you know, slight tweaks uh, completely, uh, you know, just like revamp uh, an idea. So. So, yeah, that's that's kind of how I, I look at it. Got you. Um, OK, so recently you were a part of the D.C. Pride celebration of Rachel Pollock and. Um, Yep. You know, so it put, you know, a few of her writings kind of back into print um, and then told some new stories, um, including yours, which uh, features Coagula. Um, mm -hmm. How was it being brought into that project? And um, I guess what does Rachel Pollock's work mean to you? Yeah, well, I mean, the, for me you know i i had known rachel for for years um and i, I was already a fan of that run mm -hmm. before i was a friend of hers so so that so i kind of knew exactly like like once this was set up uh what to do to make it make sense and to make it work within the continuity because for me um the the continuity was really important and i wanted to make sure i'm like look i want to bring her back uh and i want to do it in a way that makes sense within the story i don't want to wave the magic wand and you know forget these different things that happened prior i, I want this to be a very concrete sort of like this is a, a thing that's set up within the rules of the the comic that are established mm -hmm. um and and to do that in a way to sort of celebrate her so you know i i came up with this idea of you know she's in you know her consciousness is still in cliff's mind from when they fused together during the Theresius war and was kind of also able to use that as like an excuse while she's in this consciousness to sort of have a greatest hits of uh rachel going through and and seeing these other um you know characters that showed up in a run and mm -hmm. and bring up some different things like that was all very uh important to me um you know i, I had suggested um you know rye hickman and, and john workman and uh, andrea who i worked with on on this story she was the editor it was her call to even have me involved to to write this story mm -hmm. and she was very open to the idea of working with you know, rye hickman and and john workman she had already worked with she was in the process of working with john on on another thing at black label anyway mm -hmm. uh and he was the letter of Rachel's run. So, yeah. you know, I thought it was important to have something like that uh, in this, you know, meant a lot for me to have John on it. And I actually got to hang out with John a little bit at Heroes Con. And, you know, mm -hmm. we, we got to talk a little bit about it, which which was very nice. Um, and Rye, I had worked with before. I knew Rye had done some stuff uh, recently at DC's we we had talked in the past of like it'd be great if like a situation popped up where we could work together again it was like ooh a 10 pager like mm -hmm. done this is this this was the way to do it but um you know that's uh, th this sort of thing doesn't happen without dc wanting it to happen without andrea's enthusiasm and support um you know along with the rest of editorial chris conroy was also you know very supportive of this um and it was Andrea's suggestion uh, at the very end. Uh, I got to put uh, this little note sort of about Rachel mm -hmm. um, under the credits. And, and that was Andrea. She said, you know, that we have a little extra room here if you want to put, you know, a little little something. And I I, I came up with that for it. But um, but no, it, it, it meant the world to me to work on that. I've loved Doom Patrol for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I loved it before I read Rachel's run. You know, I, I think like a lot of people um, of a certain age, I was introduced to it uh, through Grant's run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not at the time it was coming out. I was too young at the time to comprehend what was right. what was happening there. I was reading like, you know, Archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics while, while things like that were coming out. Mm-hmm. But but you know it's 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 something that means a lot to me i I have original artwork from both grant and and rachel's run um you know and (laughs) i've gotten to become uh friends with richard case as well Mm. you know we got to hang out a bit at heroes we got breakfast on sunday at heroes which was very nice we um uh you know it was uh at that french bakery like that was like diagonally across with all the crazy chandeliers and stuff yeah very cool that was great it seemed like a thing that you could have seen in a doom patrol comic or the show that right Right. so yeah no definitely elaborate that place yeah no i loved it that was great (laughs) (laughs) and so um you've also got this upcoming um it's coming out August 24th, a new comic uh, from Archie, uh, Kardak the yep. Mystic. Um, what's the story about? So so for Kardak the Mystic, this is a, a Golden Age character who um, was uh, you know, one of those uh, magician-type superheroes. Um, it was basically him and his fiancée, Lorna, and they would, you know, solve mysteries or weird happenstances and robberies and you know they would deal with everything from you know gangsters to you know fishmen and Mm. things like that so you know and i love that era i love a lot of these like golden age comics and Mm. and i had gotten to use kardak in the first thing i did with archie which was uh a short in uh jinx grim fairy tales um so so this was an opportunity to sort of like go back like revamp and spend like a whole issue on like uh doing something with with kardak i got to use lorna a lot as well i thought that was you know important to to using kardak and this i think will appeal to a lot of people like if, if you like that vertigo era sort of comics if you like uh it's very sort of like you know, dark superhero-y meets, you, you know, horror supernatural stuff, like a Constantine kind of thing, like a Zatanna, Zatara, um, you know, Justice League Dark. Like, like I think there's like elements of that in it um, that that I think people really uh, appreciate. Got you. And um, let's see. So the art on Kardak the Mystic, Mystic is by Butch mm-hmm. Mappa uh, with colors yes. by Ellie Wright and letters by Jack Morelli. Uh, what's it been like working with this creative team? I mean, it's been fantastic, you know, honestly. Uh, um, I I hadn't worked with Butch or Ellie uh, directly before. Uh, Butch was also in the um, Happy Hard Days uh, anthology one shot uh he illustrated different stories so we have been in the same book together Mm. uh, but this is the first time collaborating together uh he's been incredible i couldn't believe how good the pages turned out Mm. like just just crazy i i'm i'm genuinely very impressed by it uh and and ellie i've known for years we've never worked together uh until now but i i've seen her at cons I actually got to hang out with her a little bit in dublin uh mm-hmm. back in march um the, i i went there um and it overlapped with dublin comic-con so i i dropped in there so i i got to see her for a little bit so so i mean that's been great too I, i've been a fan of hers for a while and, and jack is a pretty mainstay letterer so mm-hmm. I, i've been lettered by uh jack before and um you know again just very professional there's there's nothing it's never any any uh any notes or issues or anything when when jack's involved uh for sure so now is this a mini series it's an ongoing or how long do you think this story's running 
Well, look, you know, th- we'll have this one shot and then we'll we'll see where things go from there. Uh, you know, we're we're introducing um uh, you know, Kardak to you know, I think a lot of the people who who are picking up, you know, the the darker horror supernatural Archie uh characters and and archie has been in the process um that you know the last year it was a lot of one shots and then this year you know judgment day is like judgment day curse library like they're they're working their way back into doing some more mini series so um you know i i highly suggest you can um you know pre-order you, you know your uh, local comic shop you know kardak the mystic so you know, I suggest uh, you know people do that if if the orders are are high. You know, we'll you know there's always that chance of coming back. So you know, I I'd, I'd certainly love that. I'd love to work with Butch again. So you, you know, as well as Ellie and and Jack, obviously. But you know, yeah. Um, and, and I think there's a lot more fun that could be had with Kardak. But you know, I will say I think people will get you know a full satisfying story um reading this one shot nice nice well yeah so kardak the mystic number one is the one shot uh two covers available uh the cover Mm -hmm. a um which is by okay league of comic geeks you suck uh the cover artist is butch mappa for cover a yeah Mm -hmm. and then uh on the b cover that one is by skylar partridge yeah partridge so very cool actually i don't know which cover i like better i think i like the a cover best yeah no they're both they're really both good. great yeah really good and i had not i'm not familiar with kardak the mystic he kind of looks almost like gomez adams a bit yeah um yeah a little bit <laughs> with like the vampire streak i like it looks cool thank you yeah no that was uh butch was responsible for you know coming up with this like updated version of kardak so nice nice so um we've talked a lot about just sort of approaches to writing uh writing as a job versus writing as a passion uh what are you where are you seeing yourself going what are sort of the things you're you're looking to get into and kind of how are you mapping things out over the next few years i mean um it's a lot of just keep writing um you know it's uh yeah i i mean I have plenty of other pitches, um, getting to do more work for higher stuff. Uh, it's something I enjoy. I'll, I'll gladly do more. Mm-hmm. So I, I would love to sort of, you know, split my time between, you know, work for higher gigs and, and some creator owned stuff. Um, that's really, you know, where I'd like to be. Um, you know, I'd certainly, you know, keep doing work with the different publishers I'd have, I, I have been, if they'd have me again, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, working with Archie is, you know, fantastic. It, it was great working with Andrea at DC. Um, you know, I have a really uh, good relationship at Mad Cave. Um, you know, I, I have a good relationship with, you know, Dynamite from the times I've done editing there. I'll gladly edit at Dynamite again. So I, I'm happy to keep working with you know all those publishers and and others um i i hope i'm still doing stuff for you know all of them and you know five years at some point or another um but yeah and you know i wouldn't mind you know doing like um uh king arthur the knights of justice was like my first ya graphic novel mm-hmm. uh i certainly wouldn't mind doing some more ya stuff um i i, I definitely wouldn't mind doing more uh, original graphic novels um you know I, I i hope i i put out a few more of those uh in, in the next few years and you know I, you know there's there's a few other publishers I'd, I'd like a chance to work with so you know maybe yeah ideally i'll i'll have uh you know gotten to work with uh you know a couple more too uh in the next uh, few years but but yeah, I, I mean, that's really, you know, where I'd like to, to be. I, I'd like to, you know, mostly write, but I, I still do enjoy editing. Mm. Um, you, you know, again, happy to, you know, continue doing that. And you will know, probably do a, a little more with crowdfunding. You, you know, I'm, I'm planning on, you know, at some point, 
um you know before the end of the year you know i have a one shot that i like to crowdfund because those are pretty hard like it's funny there's a lot of publishers uh a higher end you know your marvels dcs you know archies things like that that will do one shots on certain characters but it's very difficult to get a, a one shot over at you know creator own place yes. and yeah. it, it makes sense you, you know if you have a one shot with batman mm -hmm. people know who batman is people know who spider-man is right. if it's a one shot of some guy from mm -hmm. somebody it's a hard sell i get it yeah. so you know got you well i'll definitely be on the lookout for it um and for those in the audience who also want to look out for the next uh big things from joe corallo where can they find you they can find me uh at uh I, i'm on uh twitter and blue sky at joe corallo so that's j-o-e-c-o-r-a-l-l-o -L -L -O, and at uh in instagram i'm at corallo joe so okay nice nice well joe thank you so much for taking the time to to speak with me and to our audience mm -hmm. um really appreciate it and i'm looking yeah. forward to kardak and a bunch of other stuff that i didn't even know existed now i gotta go right. grab king arthur and the knights of justice i'm excited right thank you no problem at all um well look guys again i'll leave all of uh joe's links down in the show notes and in the description of this video for the channel members uh so check out all joe's works and pre-order card act the mystic uh one shot from archie in shops on august 14th and um after you do that i don't know read something dope today peace <laughs>